Welcome back. I'm Brandon, the HBAR Bull, once again joined by Zepsi. We both do some contract work for the HBAR Foundation, but we don't do these weekly updates in any official capacity. We're just coming to you personally to give you the latest in the Hedera ecosystem. Welcome, Zep. How's it going, Brandon? It's going good, but as always, none of this is financial advice. Use it for entertainment or educational purposes only. And I'm going to add on top of that because we're going to be talking a lot about tokens today that have been doing really well, but their past performance does not imply anything about future results. The Hedera HTS ecosystem has been absolutely on fire with a lot of tokens performing very well and getting a lot of additional attention. So we're going to initially here focus on some of our favorite tokens. The first one I'm going to talk about is Sauce. That's the native token of our premier DEX saucer swap it has a lot of things going for it number one if you look at DeFi llama 97 percent of the tvl on the hedera network is on saucer swap if you don't include liquid staking from stater so they have taken the lion's share now that doesn't include h suite and i'm not sure why it's not represented yet but i think it will be in the future but if on paper you would have looked at all of our dexes you might not necessarily would have thought that Saucer Swap would have been at the top, but their execution, their user interface, how easy they've made things with tutorials and so forth, they've just become this 800 pound gorilla in the room when it comes to Hedera, DeFi in general. They also have really good tokenomics. They've set up single sided staking with something called XSauce, and it's just really captured people's attention. So that's at the center of our DeFi ecosystem. So for me, that has got to be one of the top ones. Now, I don't hold that much sauce. I'm starting to add more now, but because I didn't know which DEX was going to win, I kind of avoided them all until I realized which one was going to take the lion's share. And that's clearly Saucer Swap. And if, if you believe, even Hedera DeFi, that's certainly one of the tokens you should be in on. So Zeb, what are some of your favorite tokens? Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, Source is up there in, in my biggest holdings and the HTS economy, definitely. I've also got a bit of H Suite because outside of Source Swap, that's definitely the one that's sort of leading smart contract is DeFi, you know, that original Lehman vision. Very interesting to see. And I think that they've definitely got their own value proposition. So I do hold a bit of them as well. But beyond that, Galaxy is one of the most exciting projects in the Hedera ecosystem. Not only did they receive, you know, that grassroots funding from the foundation for, you know, being a very promising application on the network, but they also received a lot of VC funding by Animoca Brands. Animoca Brands are one of the leading, uh, if not the leading gaming VC in the whole of Web3. They cover entertainment, GameFi, AAA games, the whole lot. They sniff out quality projects with quality tokens that they think can outperform. And so I think that in itself is a massive accolade for Galaxy. And then you take into consideration what they're actually doing. They fit perfectly into the social fi narrative, i.e., you know, social finance, this idea of the Web3 social media ecosystem that returns the rights, you know, the privacy rights to the end user, but also gives them added value in terms of things like value exchange through tokenization, through personal monetization, and so on and so forth. And they are going cross-chain. For a social fire application like Galaxy to really take off, it has to get the net as far as possible. And so they've got influencers that they're onboarding, you know, a big pipeline of them, but they're also going to the likes of Polygons, the Solanas, having these conversations on how they can expand this ecosystem. And at the very heart of that will always be the Hedera token service through the Galaxy token itself, and also Hedera USDC. So the further they expand, the better. The Hedera network service will benefit from that, and the, the Hedera token service economy as well, hopefully. So for me, a very exciting application with a lot of growth potential in their ecosystem, and I'm very excited to, to see where they take us. And Zepp, I have a really good clip of Solo talking to our friend Pet from Sporting Crypto that explains some of what they're doing. When was the last time you used crypto to pay your friend back for a pizza you split? When was it? Never. Isn't that crazy to you? Yeah. 
there's a multi-trillion dollar asset class. The best use case for it is peer-to-peer -peer payments, yeah. not NFTs, and no one's using it. Today, I'm joined by Solo Cisse, who is the co-founder and CEO of Galaxy. Well, I think the best way to think about Galaxy is that it's a non-custodial wallet that does things. Up until now, like wallets are things that you bring places. Galaxy is the wallet that takes you places. You know, I want somebody to use Galaxy to ultimately decide where they go to college and monetize that decision. If you're the top five-star recruit, what's stopping you from being able to ask your fans, like, do I want to go to Ohio State in Michigan, dollar per vote? Like, winning fan base wins. That's a world that's not too far away, and that's the one I want to build towards, where ultimately anything is possible, and content creators aren't beholden to the, the platforms that they build their content on. And I think that's just the reality, is that social media needs to be reinvented from the ground up. And what do you think's being overhyped? And I hate to say this because I'm not saying it in like a bad way, but the reliance on like NFTs saving this technology needs to go away. <laughs> I think like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like NFTs are, we use them, we love them. Galaxy uses them in so many different ways. We could talk about it all day. But I think if that's what you think is the best use case for us, or if you think that's the saving grace of this technology, you don't understand the technology. And nobody's going to be surprised at my next pick, Karate. We have an event coming up later tonight. It's going to be really exciting. It's their first kickback. It's not a normal Karate Combat event, but there is Up Only Gaming associated with it. And just to give everybody an idea of what Up Only Gaming is, you get these tokens either through the open market, you can get them through airdrops, other promotions that they do, and then you can place those tokens on the fighters in these events that you think are going to win. If they win, you get more tokens. If you lose you don't lose any tokens now granted if you went and bought them in the open market you could lose in dollar terms if the market price were to go down but up until this point from the lows of where karate combat hit in november of this year to where we are now it's up 10 12x it's pretty amazing what it's done to this point not to say it couldn't go down in the future but it's been on a really good run and it's catching the attention of influencers not just in the crypto space which is certainly getting some of the top influencers there because they're going to do an influencers fight club all that kind of stuff but also people in the fight world i mean we have one of the people that's associated with it is boss root and we also have george st pierre one of the greatest fighters of all time i would say both of those guys are legends and some of the best fighters of all time but it's caught the attention of other influencers you know, in the fight world. Joe Rogan has talked about it. We have Michael Bisbing has talked about it and on down the line. And they like it, not just because of the up only gaming part of it. And actually, they, that's not the main reason. They like it because they like the style. And that brings me to my next point is I've been watching combat sports for a very long time. I love UFC, but the actual product that Karate Combat has is really exciting. I mean, the pit is superior to the cage the cage is more of a gimmick the pit is made for this kind of sport it's better for viewing the rule set is more exciting you're not going to have as much grappling which people complain about all the time that's not something that the ufc could change there was a tweet that was put out recently talking about you know karate combat and ufc and somebody replied just laughing at them saying you can't compare these two and i would agree in some ways because UFC is more established. It's much bigger. It had a 13, I think, $13.1 billion market cap in its latest merger. And you look at Karate Combat. When I first started talking about it, it was, you know, the total market cap of the token was about $100 million. Now it's closer to $600 million. But this goes back to something, an analogy that I've made several times around Karate Combat, and that is comparing it to Tesla. Again, people might laugh at that, but I remember in 2014, Tesla had about the same market cap as GM and Ford at the time. And I remember pundits on CNBC coming out and just laughing and deriding that because Ford and GM were selling so many more units and more profit, all that kind of stuff than Tesla, but they weren't looking into the future and that it, it was a superior product and they might have additional things to offshoot and so forth. And here, almost 10 years later, we see what has actually happened. Tesla is one of the most valuable companies in the world compared to Ford and GM, which haven't moved or have gone down since that time. It's the same thing here, only you can get Karate Combat at a significant discount. Now, it's not equity, but the only thing is that Karate Combat has is the token. So I look at it the same way. I think it's a superior product 
to UFC. The only thing that they're missing is a deeper pool of talent. They have Karate Combat has great talent, but they need that deeper pool of talent. And if Karate Combat continues to get a lot of attention, they're going to get that talent. So that's something that can change where UFC, they can't get rid of the cage. They're not going to change the rule set. So they can't do a lot of the things that Karate Combat can do, but Karate Combat can get the things that the UFC has. I know I went on a little bit of a tirade there, but you have another token that you're focused on in the sports world. What was that? So Sphero World are a new sports application coming to the Hedera Network, similar to Karate Combat, and they're both on that sports fi kind of vibe. You know, they've both got a token. They're both within sports and entertainment. And I think what's particularly interesting about Sphero World is the status of the partnership they have with a company called Kura. And so Kura are the biggest sports media platform in the entire MENA region. You know, they've got millions and millions and millions of monthly active users on their website and readers. So when... Kura takes Sphero World to market when they work together to, to launch their token and so on and so forth. I think there's going to be a lot of momentum behind them. And so Sphero actually haven't launched their token yet. This is one that I've bought the NFTs for so I can be part of that initial airdrop that comes out and then part of the IPO when, when that launches as well. So very excited about them given the scope of that partnership with Kura and just how big the UAE and that region, the MENA region, are going in on sports. And of course, you know, it's on Hedera. So why wouldn't I be bullish? So yeah, another exciting project there to look out for. Well, I think you make a good point there. You know, it's built on Hedera. Well, why does that make it more bullish? Well, they have a huge tool set that just makes things very easy for them. And then they can keep their costs down because we have low fixed fees and so forth. But Sticking with all this and entertainment, let's talk a little bit about meme coins. That's not exactly my wheelhouse, but I'd like to get your opinions. So as we know, you know, there's been a lot of debate around meme coins and their position within an ecosystem. But in the last year or two years, rather, we've really, really seen them take center stage. You know, we've seen Solana endorse Bonk through the Solana Saga airdrop. We've seen Avalanche come out with a culture fund dedicated to buying things like meme tokens, saying that these meme tokens are a core part of the Web3 internet culture. And memes are a core part of internet culture. There's, there's no two ways about that. Since the internet existed, memes have existed. So it seems that in the next iteration of the internet, i.e. Web3, there would be some instance of that in a Web3, you know, web 3 ified way. And that seems to be these meme coin tokens. And they serve a lot of value in bringing people in. The Hedera ecosystem, incredible, incredible institutional development, a best-in-class governance best-in-class enterprise applications. But what it has lacked historically is that retail excitement and that sort of fun component, which now SourceSwap and the others have really filled that void and we're seeing that excitement grow there. And so I think meme coins serve a lot of purpose in bringing new eyes in, making the ecosystem fun, engaging people and building that grassroot retail community. So to that point... I have got three meme coins, I think. Uh, Grelf by Warlock, who's a, a proven creator, you know, a proven community member. He's done a lot for the ecosystem. And he's actually, there's some more stuff coming from Warlock, which I'm excited about in his own personal career and endeavors that we may see him in the, in the Hedera ecosystem. I'm also holding Froger, which is by a guy called Plet Customs, another community member who's proven himself over the years. You know, he puts out the content. He's very, very engaged in the growth of Hedera, and particularly that retail side. And lastly, I've got HHC, which is from LED, who is a community manager of Hashpack and also a lead figure in Stead Pixels. So for me, the way that I'm looking at these meme coins is I'm only going to buy the ones of people that I know and trust who have proven themselves over the years, and I you know, feel like I can trust to do these things sort of credibly and legitimately within the bounds of that realm. So for me, top three there being Grelf, Froger, and HHC. But that's not to say I won't buy more in the future. You know, this is what I currently got, and I'm, I'm sure more will come in and, and capture my attention.
Well, I think when you're dealing with meme coins, you have to think about it as spending money, not investing money. It's kind of like going to the casino, right? When I go to the casino, I don't think about it as investing money, right? I think about it as I'm going to spend this money to have some entertainment with the potential of some uh, upside there. But it, it's not normal investing. That's that's not what we're thinking about. And that goes for a lot of these tokens. You know, you have to think about it as spending money. The next one we're going to touch on is gaming. And I'm going to highlight Earthlings. And I think we should probably go back here a little bit. All of these tokens that we're talking about, Zepsi and I are just retail investors in, unless we let you know that there's something else. And I am, even though I haven't gotten any compensation yet from Earthlings, I am an official advisor. So there is the potential, even though I don't have any agreements yet, that I could get some kind of an advisor token later on. And uh, Zep, you also, you're part of the DAO for Galaxy. So you get some compensation along those lines, right? Exactly. Yeah. I'm a steward of the DAO. So that is for the Creators Galaxy Protocol, which is separate from the Galaxy app, but as that protocol develops and the, you know, the DAO grows itself, I'm one of six community members that will help push through any votes and make sure that the capital goes to the right places, whether that's BD development, marketing. We're basically the ones that enact the decisions made by the DAO. And as that DAO develops again, you know, that position will become more, more effective and more prominent. But yeah, full transparency, I am a part of the Galaxy protocol or the creators galaxy protocols stewards uh, of the DAO. yeah fair enough so back to earthlings they're going to have a token called steam it hasn't launched yet like you talked about with sphere world it has not launched yet but that doesn't mean that you can't participate in some ways we'll talk about that in a little bit but they're creating a, a fantastic gaming metaverse one of the things i'm really impressed with is they have com- been completely bootstrapped to this point they are currently in talks with potentially getting some grants, but up until now, they haven't gotten any grants and they've been able to raise money through NFT sales just because they have beautiful products. They put out clips about what their gaming metaverse is going to look like and they're always beautiful. I highlight them on this show all the time because I'm just frankly impressed with what they're trying to create. They have some sidekick games or mini games. They just launched their first one on Android, so that's already out there. And that brings me into how you can start to get involved with the token right now. You can earn something called PH Steam. That's tokens that you're going to be able to trade for Steam later on just by playing that mini game that I just mentioned. You can also go and they have a claims page on their main page that you can go. And if you have their NFTs, you can get additional PH Steam that you're going to be able to trade for Steam later on. They just know how to work with community. They are true H barbarians from the core. I'm actually talking about them with some additional things that they want to do that I think are is really going to jumpstart uh, the entire H bar economy. But but we'll see. We're not going to get ahead of ourselves. But certainly go and if you have any of their NFTs, participate in that daily drop that they do. It's fun just to go in there and claim them every day and and see you're getting some additional PH Steam. I think the total amount of steam that there's going to be is 1 billion total supply. So we're not talking about, you know, a crazy total supply here. So a few steam every day actually adds up. All right. So Zep, before we move on to some other topics, uh, I wanted to see if you had any final thoughts on our HTS ecosystem. Yeah, I think one you know, final one to, to really highlight, at least in this show, you know, as this economy grows, we will cover more and more, you know, this is a a burgeoning ecosystem, which is getting a lot of attention right now. And there's a lot of high quality projects and we will continue to cover them just because we haven't spoken about them doesn't mean we won't. But the last one that I do want to cover is, is Dovu. You know, Dovu are part of what is the, probably the, going to be, at least in the short term, the biggest ecosystem on Hedera, you know, sustainability, refi, ESG, you know, That market, that climate finance market was predicted to go from billions to trillions by the president of the European Union at the most recent COP event. The Hedera Guardian is considered world leading tech in scaling these carbon markets through something called DMRV, Digital Measurement Reporting and Verification. In order for these markets to scale, it has to move into this digitized future wherein the Hedera Guardian is that most valuable infrastructure. Dovu is a core contributor to that ecosystem. 
to the developer ecosystem and is built directly upon the Hedera Guardian. At this point in time, Dover is the only project within that Guardian that has its own token. And what they are doing is enabling, you know, the next generation of these carbon credit markets through creating extremely robust, transparent and high quality credits. So much so that the Indian government, the Ministry of Transport recently came out last week saying that they have used the Dovu solution for their end of life vehicle credits. So that is a government in India. India needs to offset a huge amount of its carbon as a rapidly growing economy, as a leading global economy on the rise. And to see that they are in a relationship with Dovu there, I think is a massive signal of positivity towards what Dover are doing, towards their ecosystem and towards Hedera. So I think that's the final one that I'll cover and uh, very, very excited for the future of that team. Yeah. And like you mentioned, we're going to continue covering additional great HTS tokens that are coming out on a regular basis. But I also want to cover why this is important for the Hedera ecosystem as a whole. Most of the trades that are made for this HTS ecosystem are smart contract calls. And I remember going back in the day and we would only have, you know, 150 or 200 transactions as far as smart contract calls for Hedera. Now, because of this HTS ecosystem, that's up to over 700 transactions in, in a given week. And that's like $36,000 worth of revenue that can be used to incentivize token holders, incentivize nodes to continue to build out this network. And it's only going up into the right. This is just the beginning of this ecosystem. So that's good. But also because they can, all these different entities, they have a vested interest in making sure HBAR and the Hedera economy does well. So they're going to take the resources that they're getting and they're going to continue to plug it into the Hedera ecosystem as well. So that's all really good stuff. I, we have one more token that we're going to touch, but I'm not going to cover it because we have the co-founder of Tune FM who's going to cover it for us, Andrew. He's one of my oldest friends here in the Hedera ecosystem, and he's going to lay it all down for us. Welcome back, Andrew. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, of course. It's been a little while. I know that there's a lot of people that know everything about Tune FM. That said, there might be some new people on here. So can you give us a quick recap on the Tune FM platform in general? Yeah, so Tune FM is essentially like a Web3 Spotify or a decentralized music streaming platform. And we also have a vertically integrated digital asset marketplace. So essentially, we enable artists to get paid in ways like never before. So when the music gets played, the artist gets paid, and we facilitate that with micropayments for streaming royalties with our native token, the Jam token. And we help artists get paid over 100 times more than traditional streaming platforms like Spotify. That's exactly the kind of innovation we want to see happening within the Web3 space. Now, you've gotten a lot of attention lately. Actually, you got more coverage in crypto media than we got on Hitachi joining the Hedera Governing Council. <laughs> Can you tell us about your latest funding round? Yeah, so um, we were really uh, excited to finally announce that we closed the $20 million financing. It's actually uh, Jam Token financing from our lead investors, LDA Capital. It's actually now up upwards of twenty four million with follow on that has happened uh, since the announcement. But basically, um, yeah, it's really exciting that there's investors out there who really believe in our our growth and our project and our vision, and uh, we're going to leverage that and and really propel things forward. Yeah, and you brought up your jam token. There's been all kinds of questions around the tokenomics, how it's used. Can you run us through the details of your token? Yeah, so the jam token is actually the first HGS token to be live and the first to be publicly traded as well. And we were also one of the first users of the Hedera network. We were very early partners. And so we're sort of Hedera OGs. We've always been uh, flying the Hedera flag. And uh, also pushing Hedera adoption forward, whether it's exchanges uh, adopting the standard uh, for HTS or custody providers or wallets, uh, we're always on the bleeding edge and, and sort of trailblazing uh, on behalf of Hedera, but of course for the Jam token. And so primarily the Jam token is used 
as a utility payments token for music streaming. So because we can do micropayments, because Hedera's exceptionally competitive uh, fee structure and high throughput, security and governance, all the things that we love about Hedera, we're able to essentially facilitate these seamless micropayments directly from the listener to the artist and back if they're promoting it. And so since then, we've also developed a digital asset marketplace. And so everything is priced and denominated in jams. So artists can mint digital assets, or we call them music collectibles. But essentially, they're tokens, formerly known as NFTs, uh, which are actually uh, tied to music. So you can do multimedia, multi-file, multi-tiered music collectible drops with unlockable perks. So for example, you could have an entire album with a music video, with behind the scenes footage, and attach that to real life experiences like backstage passes or VIP packages or meet and greets, and do that all in one drop on our platform. And you can sell that for a fixed price in Jam or set it up for an auction. Uh, so it's a very powerful platform. And this essentially music NFT platform is vertically integrated within the streaming app context. So you can essentially enjoy the music NFTs where you buy them and we're the first to do anything like it. So Andrew, one of the things you kind of made it clear why this is important for the artists themselves, they get a bigger cut of the pie. They have a lot more ways they can interact with their fans. But let's focus on the fans there for a second. Why is your platform a step up for the fans compared to things like Spotify and things like that? Yeah, of course. So obviously, uh, we're way better for the artists. Um, and we put that power back in the artist's hands. But in order to win in this market, we have to be way better for the fans as well. So we have to be 10 times better for artists and consumers, aka the music fans. So there's a couple of ways that we're approaching that. First off, we have an unbelievable iOS, Android and desktop app that's coming out very soon. We're putting the finishing touches on it. Our, com our community is chomping at the bit to really get their hands on this app, um, knowing that, you know, mobile is the way that people consume music. It's the most important thing for the, our consumers. And what I can tell you is the experience on the Tune FM mobile app rivals, if not surpasses, the experience of Spotify. And we have things that you just can't get on Spotify. So... Whether it's cool power features like our music visualizer or the fact that we have the digital asset marketplace vertically integrated within the music streaming platform, those are things that really set us apart from Spotify. But also there's some areas where we are still working achieving on achieving parity with Spotify. So that's where getting the entire licensed music catalog, the 70 million songs that you would typically hear on Spotify and Apple Music. And that is that's part of our roadmap. And that's pending uh, negotiating these licensing deals uh, with the big three. That process has already been started, and I would estimate um, it's around a six-month process. And then there's a, technolo there's a technological integration component of that as well. So hopefully, before the end of this year, we will have that squared away. And then we'll also have the uh, millions, tens of millions of independent songs that are not licensed on this platform. So essentially... We'll have a much larger library than Spotify and Apple Music, ultimately, because we're really addressing the global catalog. So when we combine that much larger library uh, with the superior economics uh, that give the power back to the artist and the digital assets, along with that really slick user experience um, that surpasses Spotify on the mobile app, that's how we see our vision for actually leaving Spotify in the dust. I'm kind of curious, the funding for a startup like yours that you just received can be absolutely huge. What are the first things that you have on your roadmap that you want to make sure you get done? And do you have a call to action for the Hedera community to get involved? Yeah. Um, so, of course, the mobile app is, um, you know, priority number one. But there's a lot of other things that the funding will be instrumental in. One is it is creating a really robust liquidity for the jam token uh, so essentially and there's a technical component to this but having a lot of depth on the order book on exchanges good amount of volume so a lot of marketing has to go into that and then having a much higher 
market cap of the token and essentially allow us to actualize the true value of the jam token within the market um, and so a lot of the uh, funding is going to go directly towards liquidity of the jam token so uh, when we do on board uh, the major label catalogs that cashing out you know millions of jam um, that's earned um, is not a problem and even when we have major celebrity drops, like we're working with some uh, A-list celebrities to do some really exciting uh, NFT drops, that like cashing out those super high value, high ticket items within on the Jam Token uh, markets is a, a seamless process and we have the liquidity to support that. So I would say about a third or so is going into just pure liquidity provisioning. Um, about a third is going into marketing generally, and then about a third going into uh, development. So you mentioned the liquidity is going to be a big part of that. Is that going to be mainly focused on DeFi or is that going to be mainly focused on centralized exchanges? It's actually on both. Um, we've been talking uh, with Saucer Swap. We're going to be announcing a new, with V2, a new pool with Jam token emissions. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Uh, we're also talking with H Suite, HBAR Suite. We're already on HeliSwap as well, so we're definitely going to be increasing the the liquidity pool size significantly. So my goal is that we're by far the number one liquidity pool of all tokens on all the Hedera DEXs, so we're not overlooked. You know, sometimes people only know about the top three tokens there, even though we have a presence on, on the DEXs and we have a much larger presence on centralized exchanges, and we've been around the longest. But then a, a good portion is also going towards the centralized exchanges, uh, working with OTC partners as well. Well, Andrew, it's absolutely been a pleasure. Thank you for swinging on today and explaining it to us. Congratulations again and good luck. Thank you. I appreciate it. So it's great to hear from Andrew there, and we wish him all the luck with the additional funding they got and everything that they're doing with Jam. Uh, we are going to take a little bit of a left turn here, but you did already touch on Dovu, which is within our refi ecosystem. And we know a new player within our refi ecosystem that is bringing all kinds of tools is Demia. And I caught up with Matt. He is one of the co-founders there at Demia to give us some more information. Matt, can you explain the history behind Demia and the services that it provides? Yeah, so Demia comes from the word academia or academia, and we're really focused on sharing information. So we have a history coming back about 10 years with Tom Bauman, one of my co-founders from Climate Check, on how do we need to digitize climate data and sustainability as a whole. Um, the space, from many different perspectives, is just massively inefficient. It's very manually driven. The reporting processes are done on annual timeframes, which with digital, we can get to real-time reporting. So there's a ton of improvement available. But the big question is, how do we enable all the different stakeholders globally to trust what's happening? And so Demia, coming from its roots with Climate Check and the IOTA Foundation, has really been focused on capturing that data, um, securing it, removing friction in the access to that data, and then streamlining its interaction between projects, uh, developers, auditors, VVBs, and carbon market standards as a whole. Well, it certainly sounds like a good fit for Hedera. Can you explain specifically how Demia is improving the Hedera Guardian ecosystem, and does it include Project Alvarium? Yes, absolutely. Um, so it does include Project Alvarium. I'll start off with that. We've been co-developing Project Alvarium with our friends at Dell since 2018 to 2019, back when we brought them into the IOTA ecosystem. The serendipity of them coming into the Hedera ecosystem at the same time as us was really amazing because we reached out to them. We said, hey, we saw you're joining the governing council. They did let us know a little bit beforehand that it was happening. So we had some discussions on that and it really helped us foster like how we can bring Alvarium and annotations and all the data capabilities we had been working on traditionally into the Hedera ecosystem. What we're seeing in the Guardian ecosystem as a whole is there's issues with dynamic data, as they call it. IPFS and, and other things are great for storing files, but when it comes to sensor data or real-time data that needs very small amounts of storage and needs to be linked uh, historically, it's not the best suited for those kind of use cases. 
And so we're taking what we've done in the digital MRV and the data use cases with Dell, and we're putting those into our layer two structure for storing data and enabling it to be dynamically accessed and uploaded in real time, and then leveraging that into the Guardian ecosystem. So we're really looking forward to a lot of real time data uh, capabilities tying data into the Guardian and into the Hedera ecosystem and also pulling data out of it as well. So we can have some new cycles starting to activate over the coming year. It sounds really valuable. Now, as you mentioned, you've worked with other projects, including IOTA. What are your impressions of the Hedera refi ecosystem and the potential for collaboration across sustainability markets? That's one thing that really struck me. Um, it took me a while to understand it because there's a lot of moving pieces in the Hedera side. It's not just a, a refi application or chain like you see with some others that are out there, but there's a lot of overlap in sustainability and refi and the different circles that it's working. But the one thing that really stood out is the ecosystem. Some of the technologies, they needed things like what we have at Damia, but the ecosystem is so mature and there's so many different parties collaborating and contributing to the Guardian and to the different tools and services that get, get added into the Guardian that that's where our excitement really started to pick up because we saw all the different in interconnections that we were able to either create or um, intensify. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that come to fruition. And the work you did with IOTA, are they going to be able to leverage some of the things that we're doing? And can we possibly get some benefits from the work that had already been done over at IOTA? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I came into the IOTA side from my background in, in government work, working at the NSA and Department of Defense, because the dynamic data use case solved problems for me from a regulatory perspective. And so we built a lot of the tools around IOTA streams, IOTA identity, um, access control, peer-to-peer -peer data sharing, a lot of these things over the last five years while I was there as head of sustainability and smart mobility. And now with Demia, we're able to take those capabilities and bring them into other ecosystems as well. So there's some things maybe from a feeless nature or running things in parallel that might be good for IOTA, but using all these data capabilities and bringing them into ecosystems like Hedera and others in the future is going to create a better ecosystem for all of us to kind of flourish together. Good stuff. Now, we also saw posts about Demia working with one of the Hedera governing council members. You already mentioned Dell, and we're not going to be able to gloss over that. My audience is certainly <laughs> going to be interested in that. How did that relationship develop and what do you expect to come from it in the future? Um, so the relationship, as I kind of hinted towards earlier, had been building with us for a while. We joined the Linux Foundation together with Dell back in like 2019 or 2020. We open sourced some work with them in 2020 to 21, which was Project Alvarium. And now they've started to see that, hey, there's other ecosystems that this is gonna be valuable. And I help them understand where climate is part of that conversation and piloted that with them uh, in, in one of our, our government projects in Chile. Um, so now we're looking at how do we extend the business use cases out together? What kind of other business opportunities are there for leveraging Alvarium and annotations and different kinds of trusted data tools and use cases to bring them into a climate ecosystem like the Guardian or into other ecosystems that Hedera is active in? Well, Matt, I know I was confused about this. I'm sure the Hedera community was confused about it as well. You cleared things up perfectly. Thank you so much for swinging by and you're welcome back anytime. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. So it was great to hear from Matt there, and we're going to shift gears here a little bit. I'm going to go into a monster shark bites that we have. So check out what Rob had to say. <laughs> Rob, welcome back. How's your past couple of weeks been? Hey, Brandon. Yeah, busy as usual. Uh, moved house, got COVID. Um, I'm packing boxes now, so I found a corner that I can um, uh, do some of these questions. Looking forward to getting into it. All right. Sounds good. So these first two we'll take together. They're on the same topic. The first one has an awful lot of salt in it. The second one, not so much. So point line <laughs> says, tell us more about the four to five billion H bar allocated to ecosystem. Most probably you won't because they'll fire you. I don't know. I haven't gotten fired so far. So um, coin man, the H barbarian is much more political about it. He says, how likely is it that part of the 4.248 billion H bar recently allocated for ecosystem development will be used to initially support and subsidize the rollout of permission community nodes? Perhaps those nodes can be mandated to use a proportion of those H bars they're awarded to incentivize stakers to their node. The outcome being increased decentralization of Hedera. Let's address this head on. So when the Hedera 
treasury was originally set up, the intention was that these tokens would be distributed over a period of time and the, uh, the bulk of them were used to develop the network and govern the network. This was always the intention. And when the governing council you know, was formed, it was given the, the role of overseeing the allocation of those, um, those HBAR into organizations to, um, to do that job. Not to do it itself, but to work with um, originally you know, the engineering team. But then we, when the, uh, the network was decentralized, the LLC, which is the, uh, the governing council, allocates funding to Swords Labs, to uh, the foundation, to the Hashgraph Association, now to the DLC Science Foundation, and potentially other organizations as well as we, as we further um, decentralize. So the allocation out of treasury is voted on by the governing council. This happened um, in Singapore. Um, Actually, it happened subsequent to Singapore because there, there was a quite a, a lot of um, discussion and debate about it, and a lot of work goes into doing these things. The process is that each of the, the foundations, the organizations, prepare a case for um, further grant funding to do a particular job. And that allocation, once agreed by the council, gets transferred out of the treasury account into accounts for each of those um, allocated ring fenced, if you like, for each of those foundations. This is what has happened with this most recent tranche. It was always going to happen. And, and now it's, uh, the vote has been taken to, to do that. What then happens is that the, that, that funding isn't given to each of the organizations. What then happens is because the governing council is, you know, very broad and we meet only once a month and there are uh, different time zones involved. A lot of the actual day-to-day -day, um, work of the governing council is um, delegated to the board. And the board um, are a number of directors who have been um, appointed, voted for and appointed to the board to, to do a lot more of the, the heavy lifting on behalf of the governing council. The board have a finance committee which is day-to-day -day responsible with the management team, the executives and management team within Hedera, to release that funding against contractual arrangements or agreements that are um, made with the, the foundations. So even though it's arm's length, even though that there's no control whatsoever between the two bodies, there is an agreement to, for a foundation, for example, to do a job, and then the, um, the funding is released on the basis of um, that agreement. So it is true to say that four plus billion um, HBAR have been allocated to the foundations. That's the, the vote that's just been taken and the allocation that's been made. The HBAR themselves are not released into circulating supply. That will happen over the course of the next two, three years, however long it takes to distribute those HBAR. And they are specifically allocated for ecosystem development. So the, um, the foundation, as we know, provides grant funding to uh, develop the ecosystem, to build the HBAR economy, to provide grant funding to, um, to projects. THA, the Hashgraph Association, uh, runs the Hashgraph Innovation Program. It's announced that it's building a venture studio. Um, it runs the Enterprise Program. So all of these are, uh, you know, project support in a different way to foundation project support. The DLT Science Foundation has its own remit, has its own thing, and it uh, receives um, the HBAR allocation and, and uh, subsequent release for doing what it is doing on behalf of the, the, the entire ecosystem. So, you know, it, it sounded like a big chunk of treasury, but it, if you think about it, it's doing a lot of work, right? It, that's, that is being put to work by the foundations. It's um, being force multiplied in certain aspects. And it's over, over a long period of time. So we can expect it to be um, allocated and released in, a, in an optimal way by the, by the foundations. It is not controlled by the governing council. So once the governing council have voted for that allocation, then it's um, left to the, the board to release it per the, uh, per the agreements. To answer Coinman's question, 
No, because this particular chunk of uh, funding has been allocated to the foundations. Swell's Labs received or has received a separate um, sort of funding where Swell's Labs are working on building out the tooling and state proofs and um, and community nodes, then that's you know that's separate funding for for doing that. Um, the foundations will build on top of that or work with projects to build on top of that. I will say that I, I think that if there is competition to try to get stake from the community nodes, that a lot of the H bar that they receive as far as node rewards could end up with the H bar holders because you have to attract that stake somehow. And that's the only thing that they have to be able to attract that stake. Uh, yeah, well, if that was the intent of the question rather than the building of the community nodes, then you know, that's, that's uh, possible as well. There is, um, I mean, there, the community nodes will be permissioned to start with, and those um, operators of those community nodes will, you know, be potentially recipients of grantees, so of, of grants. So it's possible that the foundations would support those nodes, but I, I, I have no um, insight into that as well. Yeah, we really don't know exactly what it's going to look like quite yet. Now, H Barbarian MX yeah. has a question, and he added some salt to this one, <laughs> this one as well. If DREC is such an all encompassing use case, then shouldn't IBM, Google, WePro, Tata, ServiceNow, Boeing, Chainlink, Kafra, Aberdeen, ITT, and, you know, the rest of the all powerful governing council be dying to jump in and help develop it out? If not, what does that say about the project, the use case, the governance, the tech, and the future? I'd really love to know. Well, the question presupposes that the Governing Council are not involved in DREC. The reality is uh, Lehman has been coming to the Governing Council talking about DREC you know, since its inception, so well over a year. There has been a lot of discussion and debate in the committees about the application of DREC all of which have, you know, as we know, participation from the Governing Council members. Um, it's a component of a Web3 future that everyone on the Governing Council who is building Web3 and Web2.5 um, applications are super interested in. The projects that uh, we were looking at at THA, the Enterprise Projects, always considered DREC as a, as a part of the, the technology stack. They, they don't have to come out as part of the DREC alliance, you know, and you know, shoulder to shoulder have a, the whole governing council on the DREC alliance. That would just dilute the impact. You know, it's far greater impact to have you know, um, Hedera or Swells Labs and, and Algorand Foundation and, you know, whomever else, you know, from other chains coming together as part of that alliance. But it's great tech. It's an, an amazing uh, proposal. And as, as Lehman has said, it's, it's not necessarily just for Web3. Any, any secret can be stored like this. You know, one's own you know, family recipe for you know, whatever um, could potentially be, be stored like this. So um, it's, a, it's a public good. It's not directly related with, um, with the Hedera Governing Council because it's a, you know, a separate initiative of Lehman and Swerve's Lab. But... Absolutely, it will be used where it's um, where it's appropriate. Why wouldn't it be? I think the traction that we've already seen from it has been really impressive. The the Algorand, the conversations with Brad Garlinghouse, I, I think we're seeing some really good mm -hmm. traction already. And it's just the very beginning. It's really just starting. It hasn't really hit the market yet, but it's just being um, accepted into the general consciousness, getting that mind share that, that we talk about on a fairly regular basis. All right. So the next one we have is from Mark Pearl 5900. He always has some really good questions. He says, as a use case, I'm keen to to keep abreast of the adoption of Hedera within the asset tokenization ecosystem. They say the addressable market for tokenization is $900 trillion. Is there a specific investment subsector that is leading the way or showing very committed interest in tokenization? A number of other projects are hoping to participate in the tokenization space. So could you expand on Hedera's current focus and progress on this? Thank you for the question. It's, uh, it's amazing, isn't it, that uh, we, we consider, when we talk about everything's going to be tokenized in the future, that really does mean everything. And real-world asset tokenization has been kind of the buzzword of the last year for those sorts of 
you know, that transition into this future where everything is tokenized. Real world assets cover, you know, everything, you know, from real estate to funds to you know, carbon credits, as we talk about so much. So yes, we are seeing this, uh, this moving, even on our governing council, right? So Aberdeen, it's Lux Sterling Money Market Fund, um, $15 billion, uh, sorry, 15 billion pound market fund using the, the Archax uh, regulated digital asset tokenization engine, all on Hedera, of course. Quarter homes, you know, uh, real estate um, that we've talked about in the past, built with Toco and DLA Piper, uh, Red Swan, we talk about a lot, commercial real estate. And, it, you know, all the Guardian, you know, 500 million carbon credits coming, you know, from the Allcott relationship um, via the Guardian ecosystem. And this is just the start. You know, there are many, uh, many use cases, especially in the fund management um, side, that um, you'll know, benefit from tokenization and the ability to fractionalize those tokens to distribute them more widely to actually provide a far better experience for retail investment um, end potentially. But also at the, you know, the, the top end of town, your banks already manage big assets on behalf of their um, institutional clients, looking at the efficiencies, the operating efficiencies of um, real world asset tokenization. And then things that you don't really think of as uh, real world assets like stable coins, you know, it's, uh, you know, fiat is an asset in, in many ways and um, enabling the tokenization of that um, creates the ability to do swaps. So you got, you know, um, asset type um, tokens and fiat type tokens and DVP you know, delivery versus payment is just the, the swap process that requires, you know, is instant clearing and settlement. In fact, there's no clearing at all on the blockchain or a distributed ledger. So it's instant settlement. So that's why, you know, the, um, the big asset managers, the big banks are all um, experimenting and actively working in this space. And um, our, our ecosystem is no different. All right, Rob, that might actually lead into our next question, which this came a couple of weeks ago, was sitting in our, in our queue. So it's going to be a little bit out of date, but it comes from Babushka, who asks maybe one question for next week. What about the last governing council member, Kafra? We don't hear a lot about them. Is everything okay between them and Hedera? And what is their use case? Thanks, Babushka. Uh, obviously, they're not the last. Um, governing council member, given that we've just announced Hitachi last week. Kofra, Kofra have been on the governing council about a year. The, for those of you who don't know, Kofra is a privately owned, but huge conglomerate, um, based out of, out of Switzerland. They own big retail brands like CNA, uh, but they also have, uh, billions of dollars of assets in the uh, real estate sector and also have uh, sort of fund management and they're interested in uh, growing their renewable energy portfolio as well. So they're one of these big deals that no one's heard of. They have actually been very active on the governing council. Jerome Muster, who's their prime, uh, primary representative, I met in Singapore. He and his team um, had come to Singapore to you know, be actively involved. They, um, he tells me that they are still working through their use cases, and, but they're, you know, they're working with the THA. They've been talking to me. We'll get them onto CorpCon very soon as well to kind of refine the ideation around the use cases. But like I was just saying, it's probably a, um, a real-world asset use case. They're very keen... Um, on tokenizing um, the assets that they that they manage in a similar way to how Aberdeen have, so they're kind of talking to Aberdeen and Duncan as well, and you know, sort of taking notes from them. And on the Guardian, the ESG and the renewable energy side as well, but of, um, of huge interest as it is for most of our governing council. So um, yeah, just another example that just because a uh, a massive governing council member um, is quiet. That's just the way with corporates. You know, they don't, uh, uh, they don't share everything until it's uh, absolutely necessary. 
Yeah, understood. And I can't wait to hear what they've come out with. So next up, we have one from Oak BZ who asks, Rob and Brandon, is this statement true? All other cryptos currently in existence could be built and run on Hedera, but Hedera could not be built and run on any other crypto. What are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, there are lots of ways to answer this one. I think one has to remember basic principles of um, networks based on cryptography and you know, blockchains and distributed ledgers. So generally, the, crypto, the native cryptocurrency of the network is necessary for the network to operate. Of course, we can have private permission blockchains that don't need cryptocurrencies. We can have um, pseudo blockchains like the ones that you, know, you see in mainland China that have been neutered of their cryptocurrency and you know, um, don't operate in, in that way. But generally, public networks, um, certainly proof of stake networks, um, have a native cryptocurrency. So it's very difficult to, to say, you know, you can move a cryptocurrency to, to Hedera because actually that would kill the network that, uh, that it's being used as, as fuel or gas or to, to incentivize, incentivize behaviors and to secure the network. The two go hand in hand. However, there are a lot of, um, tokens that are released on other networks that could be issued on Hedera. And equally, they would probably operate far better on Hedera. So tokens that are associated with uh, Web3 solutions, if that Web3 solution was built in Hedera, then those tokens would operate and presumably operate far better because of all the you know, um, superior properties of Hedera over other networks. And of course, we do have a lot of other tokens that are represented on Hedera. We have wrapped Bitcoin, we have wrapped ETH, we have wrapped AVAX and LINK. So you can certainly represent crypt other cryptocurrencies on our network. I mean, there are a number of great tokens that have been ported over from other networks. So Dovu, um, we see Bank Social about to do it with BSL. So, you know, the, um, the wrapping of tokens enables interoperability between um, networks, which is you know, a great infrastructure. But the porting of one to the other requires you know, it to be deprecated or, or entirely burned on the first network to, to fully come over to the, um, the, the Hedera network. I think in, in you know, years to come, what we'll see is these abstraction layers forming where tokens move freely across networks, but, but get, get st stuck into the networks where they can best service the solutions that are being built with them. Yep, we're just at the beginning here, so it should be fun to watch. All right, so this next one we're going to have to do in rapid fire because Eduardo has three questions. So the first one is, do you expect any other cryptocurrency to integrate the governing council like Link? So Chainlink being a representative on the Hedera governing council. Do you think we're going to see other crypto players join the Hedera governing council, Rob? I think I, I wouldn't rule anything out. I think by the question um, that says other cryptocurrencies integrating the governing council, I think what um, Eduardo means is will we see other Web3 players on the governing council? And I think that's certain. Um, in fact, we have a bit of a gap on the governing council for you know, um, hardcore Web3 um, players. Now, that doesn't necessarily need to mean other networks. I think we'll probably see a lot more relationships through the DREC Alliance and the, you know, the um, uh, maybe even the DLT Science Foundation. You know, those uh, those ties to other networks will uh, will form over time. The Governing Council itself, which is you know its purpose is to govern the network, govern the Hedera network, um, will have other Web three participants and Governing Council members for sure. Whether there are um, other cryptocurrency networks and uh, is, is, I think, probably unlikely. But um, the alliances will form as well. So I think you know the grown-up uh, networks will start playing far better together as the uh, as the infra infrastructures mature. So the next one, Eduardo asked, is, "Do you miss the Hashgraph Association already?" Oh, of course. I mean, I've worked closely with almost all of the, the ecosystem. And the Hashgraph Association, I was there to do a job, 
which was to set up the enterprise program. I talked to Kamal and the team back at uh, Hashgraph Association regularly, almost every day. And um, although I've got a different role now, of course, my CorpCon role you know, enables me to, to talk to them. So although I have no, no official function, it's good to, to know what's going on. Same with the foundation, same with Hedera, same with Swell's Lab. So, you know, we, uh, we don't officially have too many touch points, but we talk all the time because it's, um, you know, this is a collaboration. Web3 is all about collaboration. So I don't feel like I'm too far away from the Hashgraph Association. But the new role is definitely worth, was worth uh, moving for. There weren't many roles. There weren't many more kind of um, hats I could wear in the, the ecosystem. Um, but the new role is definitely uh, worth, uh, worth moving on to at the at Australian Payments Plus. All right. Good to hear, Rob. So this one, of course, this question was asked a few weeks ago. So this was before Davos, but Eduardo also asks, what can we expect from Davos this year? So we'll change it up a little bit and say, what did you think about what Hedera had coming out of Davos this year? I loved watching from afar. It was definitely a large amount of FOMO, seeing what was going on in, in Davos. I like the cold. And being in Australia, I kind of crave uh, proper cold which is why I'm going back to, to go skiing there next month. But I think we really stepped it up this year. The Belvedere layout looked amazing. The quality of the panels that were set up was, was incredible. You know, the sorts of people that we had there that had been attracted. You've mentioned Brad Garlinghouse. And, you know, we really have a lot of great content and a lot of leverage by being in Davos. You know, the crowds that were coming through that I saw were, um, you know, it was always, always busy. So, uh, and I know that there are a lot of conversations. So, you know, the, the conversations are, you know, beyond what is Hedera now, but, you know, what can we do together? And um, I expect the, the um membership committee pipeline to to be topped up um, off the the back of Davos and content will have been created as well as relationships that will spend the next year you know um, working and um, building on and all for the good of the Hedera ecosystem so yeah Um, bravo to you know Brett so Brett McDowell kind of uh, always drives Davos. It's a, it's a stage that he really believes in. Christian and the marketing team did an amazing job in setting it up. And, um, and to everyone else who was there, you know, to, to really leverage the opportunity, I think it was uh, executed very, very well. And I want to give a huge hat tip to Max, who did a great job communicating everything that was going on over there as well. So the last question we have comes from Michael. He says, I'd really like more visibility into the lull. And he's talking about the dips in transaction volume. We had one recently. We've recovered up to over a thousand transactions per second, but not quite up to the, the peak that we saw most recently. But still, we have recovered significantly. Now, he goes on to say it really goes to concern about whether it's just a lull or it's a symptom of a network problem. Additionally, we've heard from Mance and Shane in their recent interview that Atma is not the only entity using the network. If that were the case, how is the TPS hitting low double digits? A bit of transparency would go a long way here. Perhaps an Atma interview would help. And Rob, if you can get, help me get an interview with Atma, I would absolutely love it. <laughs> but he goes on to say, I'm seeking to gain traction for the network in a large corporation and the yo-yo of transaction volume is difficult to explain when discussing stability. Any help is welcome. So, I mean, we do talk about this a lot, obviously. It's, it's a very um, obvious oscillation that we see. We tend and we usually see the lull as a, you know, a few days where Atma is indeed kind of resetting or, or preparing itself for the next big step up. That hasn't happened this time. I think we've come up back up to about a thousand transactions per second, but I suspect it will continue to climb given that the, you know, the previous high was two and a half, three thousand. It is true that when that happens, we see the background activity, which I think actually, you know, although it's, it, it can go particularly low, I think it's, uh, the trend is, is up. And that's just normal, right? We have a, we have an outlier like Atma, which is demonstrating the ability of the network to scale massively 
And while these other use cases are coming down the track and becoming, you know, uh, or will be um, being implemented on the mainnet, it is the main show. I don't think it, it you know, from the p- perspective of um, the questioner, I think it's a good story to tell internally that shows that it's, um, you know, the scale is there, the throughput is there. There is headroom because we, we've seen spikes up past the 10,000 transaction ceiling. So there's, there's kind of certain comfort that can be, can be um, given to that. And I also don't think that it demonstrates instability at all. It actually uh, demonstrates a lot of stability, you know, because the, the network is operating through a range. The, um, the periods of low TPS are actually when, you know, a big user of the system is taking a breath, but it doesn't destabilize the network at all. The network operates at, you know, tens of transactions and then it steps up to three, you know, 4,000, and then, you know, after a period of time, it comes back down again. Um, That's actually a really good way to consider the operation of the the network. It's very stable at at, uh, both ends of the range, actually. not not, We're nowhere near the top end of the range, of course. So that's, you know, that that should be um, confirming the ability of the network rather than, you know, put any any doubts in, in people's minds. However, I know that can be quite a nuanced um, and tricky conversation to have with internal stakeholders without all the facts. So I'm very happy to be involved in a conversation personally with whoever that uh, that big um, enterprise is to help support the the discussion or the the ideation around what could be done with the network. And I um, encourage the... um, the questioner to reach out to me directly. I'm very happy to, to ha- take that offline. And and Rob, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Is it just a direct message on X? Uh, on X, on LinkedIn, um, via you know, uh, responses to the, this this show on YouTube or you know, however you can get hold of me. There's, there's a, a, a gazillion ways to, um, to get me. I, I hide in the open. And I can certainly help make those connections as well, Michael. And the last thing, we don't have any more uh, community questions, but we do have the HCS20 that we went over with patches last week. And and you had some points you wanted to make around that. What were your thoughts on HCS20 there, Rob? Uh, Well, yeah, I've got points, which uh, is a pun on HCS20 itself. But um, I love the idea of HCS20. We have so many great and rich tools and services but this this feels like a very accessible standard that can be used with fairly simple tools, and I'm I'm very excited about what you know the community might be able to do with things like this, right? So it's a very simple standard, and what I was thinking was, how could we use that for shark bites? Um, we initially started thinking about you know sort of issuing some kind of um, Reward points for having for asking questions, but that's a little bit, you know, Web two, um, not too exciting. Um, these aren't tokens, of course. There are kind of inscriptions on the ledger, so there are some benefits to being able to easily you know, mint in the, in this nomenclature rather than tokenization nomenclature, and um, and transfer. So uh, I'd like to run a little experiment. And what I've done is I've created a, um, I've deployed a, an HCS20 onto the, the open topic. And that is, there are 50 million of those. And what I'm encouraging people to do is to go and mint from the, um, from that particular HCS20, um, uh, which is called Sharky. Use the, the shark ticker, so the, the little shark emoji is the tick, and you can mint up to ten thousand of these at a time. And what we want to do is, and I've got all the instructions on X, so maybe we'll put them into the the comments section here as well. But it's a four step process. You get the the Turtle Moon tools. You mint your shark tokens enough to uh, transfer to the account that I'll give you. And then in the memo, you put the question. And then what we'll do is we'll gamify it so the top 10 
value amounts that are sent. So you've got to do lots of minting at 10,000 a batch to try and get into the top 10 of questions. And then whatever the questions are, I promise to answer them. As long as I'm not in breach of, um, of any of the policies for the Hedera Governing Council or uh, conflicted in any way, I, I'm, I promise to answer them um, honestly. It's a fun little experiment. I think we'll learn a lot from um, from doing that, and then we'll we'll evolve if it's um, if it's fun and makes sense. It's certainly not as easy as just writing a question in the comments in in YouTube. But uh, what we're trying to do is to get more more people using the network. You know, for one hundredth of a, a cent, you can send a question, and um, I think over time, what we'll do is we'll provide reward. We will do rewards as well. So. Um, We'll think about creating a, um, a, a set of NFTs that are rewards for for doing the uh, for for getting the right questions in. We're gonna go ahead and eat our own cooking, right, Rob? I think we use the network like <laughs> this, and that's exactly that. what we should. That's what we should be doing. All right, so that's pretty much all we have for this week, Rob. As always, thank you so much for coming on, and we'll see you next week. I've got one more thing. Um, I've got to thank, as ever, Elizabeth Chase for doing my amazing shark and Hedera um, t-shirt. This is my, my new favorite. But I also to thank her creative artist who, who drew this, uh, Ethan. And he's uh, Theo Technism on Twitter or X. He's um, at Theo Technism. And he's, um, he's an amazing artist. So thank you for doing the, um, the, the shark bite um, official t-shirt now. So huge shout out to Elizabeth as well as Ethan. Rob, thanks again. My pleasure. See you next week. So again, participate in Rob's HCS20 initiative to get some questions on for the next Shark Bites. We'll see how long it takes us to get additional questions there, but I hope you guys all follow what he suggested. All right, so back in the day, I remember when Google got announced as one of the Hedera Governing Council members. The article they put out around that was not very glowing. They actually had to do some retractions around that, but that has changed. It seems like Coindesk is maturing a little bit and giving Hedera a fair shake. What do we have around that? Yeah, so we've seen Bank Social, who you know you've had on before, who are really pioneering the ecosystem, both with DREC, but also with their own financial products within our ecosystem, you know, working with credit unions to bring them into the world of Web3. They have been put forward as a, a speaking slot at Coindesk and they've put out their, you know, voting upon that so that they can get that position and really, really tell the world or the world at Coindesk exactly what they're bringing to the Hedera ecosystem and exactly how Hedera can reshape this kind of financial future. Next, we've got Flix Mobile, who are, you know, supported by the Hashgraph Association, but also T-Mobile, who are the subsidiary of Hedera Governing Council Deutsche Telekom. So they are a mobile network deep in, working within Web3. They've got endorsement recently from Masari in the state of deep in 2024, and they've got a lot going for them there. They also have a potential slot at Coindesk. You know, they're, they're fitting that deep in narrative, they're fitting that enterprise narrative. So again, if we can go and vote for them as a community to get that speaking slot, We'll have two really high profile um, speakers, and I think that would be a massive benefit for the ecosystem. So I'm sure they're on the screen now. If you can go and vote for them as the community, that'll really help get them on the platform that they deserve. So following on the Coindesk news, the chief content officer at Coindesk, so the man in charge of you know what goes in and out, came out with a stellar review of Hedera at Davos, particularly around the decentralization of AI. So he covered the climate GPT news that we covered last week with Equity Lab, with Hugging Face, and of course, leveraging the Hedera Consensus Service. So Coindesk put out a great article, and then the chief content officer himself went out the extra step and retweeted it on his own account with a quote tweet at Hedera and Equity, saying that the future of AI needs to be decentralized, and in this case, Hedera is a, a key component of that. So Hopefully, you know, like you said, this could be a shift in the kind of uh, exposure that Hedera gets, at least in this field, which is, is AI. Yeah, absolutely. So the next thing I want to get into, we've talked about the Google Cloud program a few times in the past. We talked about how Novatech got an exclusive partnership with them, and that that's 
more than just using this this Google Cloud credit program, but we had one of our favorite players in the Hedera space, Kabila, get added into that program as well. Can you tell some more about that? Yeah, so Kabila now joins the ranks in the NFT ecosystem alongside Sentient, the Hedera marketplace, to get these credits from Google Cloud. And Kabila is a you know an all-rounded sort of tooling NFT tooling, best-in-class tooling, really for the Hedera NFT ecosystem. They have launch pads. They have you know NFT generative art. I believe you to create your own project. They've got you know lists for airdropping throughout the Hedera ecosystem, and there's a lot more coming from where that came from. So I spoke to Manu actually earlier this week. Heard about his vision for Kabila. Very very excited for what's to come. They've also actually got their KBL token, which is in the works. It's not going to launch yet, but he's said to me that he's going to get this perfect. He's working with you know tokenomics experts and so on and so forth, so that it meets the criteria which they've already put out, which is very 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 strong product. So excited for where this you know extra capital takes Kabila, and yeah, excited for the future of their their own ecosystem there. So one thing we saw this week from council member Aberdeen, you know, the, the biggest wealth manager in the UK and an ardent supporter of Hedera, they joined this public versus private blockchain debate. You know, this has been a debate that has existed for a long time, but especially since the Bitcoin ETF news. You know, we've got Larry Fink saying the future will be tokenized. And then we've got a lot of people within Web3 saying that this tokenized future will be on private networks rather than public because as a private network or rather because as a massive asset manager, they want all the control they can get. Well, Aberdeen, as the biggest wealth manager in the UK, active wealth manager in the UK, came out saying quite the opposite. They said, we are building on Hedera as a public network because it's got this governance structure that we trust, these validators that we trust, it's got this best in class hash graph technology, but also because they believe that the reason why asset managers, the reason why wealth managers, traditional finance want to get involved is because of the liquidity that these markets, these public markets enable. That is the key grab for all these TradFi institutions. Is that the core reason why they want to get into Web3 in the first place, why it got their attention? And it is on the public markets that the most liquidity will, will be, the most user participation will be, and, you know, the biggest outreach that they can get. So for Aberdeen, they're all in on public, and we'll see where the others go. But it's great to have Duncan out there, you know, making these you know, big claims for us. And sticking with the TradFi space, Shane had some thoughts that were covered by Cointelegraph on the Bitcoin ETF, right? So Shane got a really good list of quotes out with Cointelegraph earlier this week on his opinions on the Bitcoin ETF. And it's safe to say that Shane is very bullish on this. You know, he's, he said, you know, himself that the reason why they've taken such a massive step, i.e. approving a Bitcoin ETF, is obviously because they believe in the future of Bitcoin, but also the underlying technology. And of course, that's ratified by the likes of Aberdeen and Larry Fink that we just mentioned. So it really seems that Hedera is positioned for that as a leading institutional ledger. And of course, it's, it's great to have Shane there as a key opinion leader with Cointelegraph, you know, preaching that to, to the masses. Absolutely. Now, I am going to take a hard left turn here. We already talked about Karate Combat, but I wanted to make sure to cover the odds. I didn't get Dane on this time. I'm going to get him on for Karate Combat 44, but I wanted to make sure all the viewers at least had the odds of what's going on in this kickback one. So now these odds are going to be updated on a regular basis. I initially got them from Fight Odds, Nick Kalikas, but I also updated them from Bet Online AG. So the first fight is Luis Melendez and Jose Ferreri. Luis is a major favorite here coming in at minus 700, which is a win probability of about 88%. Again, these odds both on Up Only Gaming and on the sports book are going to be updated all the time. So I change the karate that I put into these different fights depending on how those things are changing. That's why I'm not giving you the weightings on my picks. That said, I am pretty much going with all the favorites this time. And you can see most of the favorites are pretty heavy. So again, Melendez has a win probability of 88 percent the next one is a bantamweight match vergara against fought so fought obviously has the right name for it but vergara is sitting at minus 450 which is an 82 percent win probability 
Next up, we have a heavyweight fight, and this one is one of my strongest convictions. We have Ronald Dunlap versus Michael Cora. Dunlap is coming off of a win in the PFL, so that's a pretty big promotion, and he has an 88 win probability with his odds sitting at minus 700. Next up at Bantamweight, we have Oliviera versus Akhmadov, and Oliviera is at minus 260, which is a win probability of 72%. At welterweight, we have Alvarez versus Bowen. Alvarez coming in at minus 230, which is a win probability of 69%. And then another heavyweight matchup between Northrop and Anglade. Northrop is a strong favorite, sitting at minus 305, which is a 75% win probability. At Bantamweight, we have Kakarmanov, who put on a great show in the last Karate Combat event. He is sitting at negative 1,000, which is a win probability of 91%. But that is reflected even more so in the up-only gaming odds. So you have to take that into consideration as well. And for the main event, we have Luderbach and Smith. Luderbach is a heavy favorite at minus 425, which is a win probability of 81%. So good luck out there with your up-only gaming. We have this event, and then in less than a month, I believe, we have Karate Combat 44, which is going to have the Influencers Fight Club. That could be a really big one, so I'm really looking forward to it. And Zeb, we had some more information come out around Reality Plus. Can you tell us about that? So Reality Plus are a team that works with some of the biggest global brands in the world. Already they've brought FIFA to the Hedera network with Own the Zone. They're working with BBC Studios on Doctor Who Worlds Apart, which is one of the biggest fan bases in the world, one of the most diehard fan bases in the world. But they also work with ITV Studios, another massive, massive TV firm within the UK, and a lot more. And they have selected Hedera as their exclusive network for every single project going forward, for every single global brand going forward. And the reason for this is twofold. The trusted brands, the biggest brands trust Hedera. They trust the governance. They trust the validators. They trust everything about the way it's been set up. And two, the relationship that Tony Pierce of Reality Plus has with Alex Russman and the foundation team has been great. They've been working together for years. They've been growing this relationship for years. Now to a point where Reality Plus feel comfortable putting everything on the Hedera network going forward. So more global brands to come, more millions of NFTs as we've seen with Doctor Who to come, more high quality IP coming to the gaming ecosystem and just all around a very, very positive development for Hedera. Absolutely. No question about that. And with that, let's get into some network analysis. Over the past week, Hedera has been averaging about 1,400 transactions per second. Again, we had more than 700,000 smart contract calls in that time. All told, that is a total of 835 million total transactions in the past seven days, with a peak of about 4,200 TPS. Average time to consensus is actually below 3.2 seconds, and we had over 121,000 accounts created just in the last seven days. Looking at our fungible tokens, we have a new one at the top this week with Karate, which is followed by Wrapped HBAR and then the meme coin Lehman, which either by design or a poor launch rugged and is sitting at <laughs> next to... Z and is sitting at next to nothing in terms of price, highlighting the risks of participating in all crypto, but especially tokens that aren't well established. Next up, we have Black Mamba, Sauce, the meme coin Unlucky, then Dovu, USDC, Energy Trade Token, and HSuite. Our NFTs are dominated by Lithos, with Rant CPU taking the top three spots, followed by Saucer Swap's Liquidity Token, the gaming team Nada Slime World NFT. And Zep, before we move on, do you have any thoughts on Nada? Yeah, so Nada are one of the most criminally underrated uh, teams in the Hedera ecosystem. You know, they have capitalized on that APAC region incredibly. You know, they are a South Korean team targeting mobile gaming through GameFi, through their NADA token, and through just a very attention-catching game. You know, they've done a great job in growing their token. You know, they get millions and millions of volume, I think, a day. Um, they've worked closely with the Blade Labs team to, to enable that. I actually spoke to the Blade team, and I think since they started working with Blade about two years ago, their retention as a Web3 app went from about 3% to about 50%, I think. So they've been growing behind the scenes incredibly. They, um, they're they not an English native speaking team. So I think that's probably why we don't hear much from them. But they're doing you know amazing work within that region, within that part of Web3 gaming. And they're 
really proving that the value of game file on Hedera through tokenization because of the fees, you know, the, the structure, the, the efficiencies of the token service, as we've spoken about many a time. Well covered, Sep. Next up, we have the Times Blade Wallet Loyalty Card, Coin and Gem, the Karate Combat themed Karateka game NFT, and Zero Pixels to round out the top 10. And Zep, with that, we'll go ahead and get into some DeFi. Taking a look at DeFi Llama, not including state or liquid staking, Hedera DeFi TVL is knocking on the door of $80 million. Saucer Swap makes up $77 million of that, and Hella Swap the balance. That said, HBAR Suite is not covered by DeFi Llama, but I got a report that it has about $3.5 million worth of TVL. So if I can confirm that, they may take over for Hella Swap when I report yields next week. Taking a look at some of the staking rewards on Saucer Swap's popular trading pairs, HBAR HBAR X version 1 is at 5%, HBAR Sauce version 1 is at 19%, version 2 at 54%, HBAR USDC version 1 is at 30%, V2 61%, and HBAR Karate is at 102%. But remember, Karate TVL only shot up because we have up only gaming tonight, and the returns on there will be much higher than you can expect to provide liquidity. Over on Heliswap, HBAR Heli is at 97%, 16% on HBAR USDC, and 63% on HBAR Karate. Moving over to the HBAR and crypto markets, crypto had a pretty good dip this week, which I bought, but since then we've started to recover. Bitcoin is about flat on the week, but up over 5% on the day. HBAR is down 2% on the week, but up over 4% on the day and is sitting at 7.4 cents at the time of recording. We can expect resistance at 7.8 cents if we keep heading north, and we should see support between 6.8 and 7 cents if we turn lower. All right, Zep, that's pretty much all we have. Is there anything else you'd like to pass on? I mean, I think the biggest takeaway at the moment is this HTS heat wave. You know, we're seeing projects doing 4x, 5x, 2x, 3x, 10x within our own token service economy for the first time. You know, we've seen other networks take off a bit earlier, the ones that were in DeFi earlier. And it seems like we're really getting our time in the light now, the time in the sun. And this is only going to keep going. Sources Swap is now what has over a billion HBAR associated with it. They are expanding their language outreach twice in the last two weeks. I think they've added new languages because of all the new people coming in. And I think just we've got so many utility coins that are coming to launch. We've got so many that already exist. We've got our meme coin economy. And then alongside that, we've got global IP like BBC and Doctor Who coming into our gaming and entertainment ecosystem that are going to bring, bring those Web 2 folk over. So I think right now there's a lot of things to be excited about. Um, and yeah, that's, you know, that's me this week. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, this is only the beginning. I think some of the things these teams have going, as we alluded to earlier, are really going to kind of supercharge the HBAR economy. So we should be really excited about that. Next week, I have Quick Picks, who is a new team that's building within the Hedera ecosystem, but really exciting stuff there. I'm going to record some stuff with Alex and SkewX. I don't think that's going to be in the next show, but we'll be getting that stuff out pretty soon. I'm going to do a Twitter space just on meme coins. So tune into that one. I think it's going to be at 4 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday. That one should be a lot of fun. Participate in the HCS 20 thing that Rob talked about. Definitely do up only gaming for karate combat tonight. That's pretty much all we have. Wait a second. One more thing I'm going to add at the end. Reality Plus, their Doctor Who game. We have a tutorial to run you through that. Now that's all we have. We'll see you next week.